Western nations must realize that we also have weapons that can hit targets on their territory. All this really threatens a conflict with the use of nuclear weapons and the destruction of civilization. That was the chilling message that Vladimir Putin sent to Ukraine's allies in the build-up to the Russian presidential elections. We now know that Putin won that election by a landslide, though obvious questions remain about the election's legitimacy, but the message he sent with that single quote was clear. Russia is ready to use nuclear weapons if it believes its sovereignty is under threat. Still, those who have been paying attention to the events in Ukraine will tell you that this is far from the first time that Putin has threatened to use nukes, namely tactical nuclear warheads, even going so far as to move some of those nukes to Belarus, a country he already used as his launch pad into Ukraine, a location close enough to allow Putin to hit any target in the country with his nukes. Still, there's something about this latest threat that's different. Which brings us to the key question that we aim to answer in this video, why is Russia finally ready to use nukes? The first answer comes from something we touched upon in the video's intro, a threat to sovereignty. Toward the end of February 2024, France's President Emmanuel Macron took part in a meeting in Paris with several of his European partners. The purpose was to discuss what steps they could take to help strengthen Ukraine as Russia continues to take territory in the country, with the recent taking of Avdiivka likely to be high on the agenda. Following that meeting, Macron held a press conference, and while speaking to the press, he floated the idea, perhaps even the possibility, of sending troops into the beleaguered country. At the very least, he claimed that France wouldn't rule it out if the situation called for it. The comments caused an international uproar, not just in Russia, but also amongst France's allies. Though Macron was quick to point out that there's no defined plan for sending troops into Ukraine, stating, there's no consensus about sending ground troops in an official way. The comments quickly caught the international community's attention. Adrian Watson, the National Security Council spokesperson at the White House, pointed out that President Biden had been very clear that the U.S. would not send any of its soldiers to fight in Ukraine. NATO followed suit, saying there were no plans for NATO combat troops. The UK, Poland, even Sweden, the newest NATO member, roundly rejected the idea, as did Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who said there had been no agreement on his side for Macron's proposal. Still, Macron remained bullish. In the wake of his and Ukraine's allies summarily dismissing the idea of sending troops, he pointed out that France could do so without the help of NATO. If a country sends troops somewhere else in the world, he said, it doesn't affect NATO. There is one main reason why almost every Western nation was quick to distance itself from Macron's idea. Putin was listening. And the very concept of any Western nation sending troops into Ukraine constitutes a threat of Russia's sovereignty in his eyes. To him, any troops that enter Ukraine are invading Russian soil, a belief that's backed by his attempted annexing of the country in the first place. Putin doesn't believe Ukraine as it exists today is a country. It's a Russian territory gone rogue that he is reclaiming, and given that Russia owns that land, in Putin's mind any troops sent in by a foreign country would constitute an invasion in much the same way as sending soldiers to Moscow. Putin delivered his response to Macron's words during a State of the Nation address he held just prior to Russia's March 2024 elections. He warned that any country that chose to send troops to Ukraine would face tragic consequences while also using Macron's words to justify his own threats. Putin noted that while many accuse Russia of planning to attack NATO allies, Western nations that are part of NATO are talking about the possibility of sending a NATO contingent to Ukraine. It was after this that he delivered his threat to use nuclear weapons. He also pointed out that Russia has a history of defending itself against European aggression. We remember the fate of those who sent their troop contingents to the territory of our country, he said, likely alluding to the failed military campaigns of Napoleon Bonaparte and Adolf Hitler. Now, Putin claims, the consequences for the potential invaders will be far more tragic. Some might argue that this was all a test by Macron. He wanted to suggest the threat of troops on the ground to gauge Putin's reaction. He certainly got it with nuclear threats, as Putin's belief that Ukraine is Russian territory means that he would be ready to launch should it be, quote, invaded by Western forces. It's also telling that no other nation, NATO ally or otherwise, agrees with Macron. None of them are saying that they'll send troops to Ukraine. The reason is they think Putin might actually follow through on his threat if they did. The West also has another reason to believe that Putin might use nuclear weapons. Putin's war in Ukraine is not going as he expected. At the time of the making of this video, we're two years into a war that Putin believed would last only a month or two. Ukraine has put up an enormous fight, even launching a counteroffensive against Russia. 
Though that offensive failed, it showed that Ukraine was far from willing to lay down and allow the Russian steamroller to run over them. They've also been buoyed by enormous amounts of aid, both financial and military, delivered by other countries. Statista points out that Ukraine has received well over 250 billion euros in aid, approximately $271 billion, between the war's beginning and January 2024, with more aid likely on the way. Kyiv has used that money to bolster its defenses and cause serious damage to Russia's military. Ukraine's General Staff of the Armed Forces claims that Moscow has lost 414,680 soldiers during the war, with 180,000 of those perishing on the battlefield, while a substantial number have been either captured, injured, or have otherwise fled the Russian army. Ukraine also claims it's destroyed 6,610 Russian tanks and 12,682 armored personnel vehicles, along with 25 Russian boats and warships. Add to that 345 planes and 325 helicopters Ukraine claims to have taken down, and it's clear that the war is taking a toll on Putin's forces. Assuming these figures are accurate, the possibility remains that they could be inflated for propaganda purposes, it's clear that Putin has lost more than he expected and seen Russia struggle on the battlefield. Alone, that wouldn't be reason enough for him to deploy nuclear weapons. For all these threats, Putin knows that support for Ukraine would eventually dry up were he to continue fighting a war of attrition. And with recent Russian advances such as the previously mentioned taking of Avdivka, Russia likely sees itself slowly but surely winning. But with all the added potential threat of facing Western troops, be they France's alone or a contingent of NATO troops supplied by Western countries throughout Europe and the Americas, the tide of war could turn against him. And if that was the case, he could combine his reasoning that any incursion would amount to an invasion of his territory with his fear of losing on the ground to justify the launch of nuclear weapons. There's another element to Putin's latest threats. Not only does he believe he would be justified in launching nukes if France or any other country sent troops to Ukraine, but he also appears to genuinely believe that Russia holds all the cards in a nuclear battle. On March 13, 2024, CBS News reported on Putin's claims that Russia's nuclear triad, which is the three-headed weapons arsenal, that would allow it to launch nuclear weapons via land, sea, or air, is, quote, much more advanced than America's. It is more modern than any other triad, Putin claimed. Only we and the Americans actually have such triads, and we have advanced much more here. After making that claim, Putin went on to repeat his threat that he would be ready to use that triad against any threat to the existence of the Russian state, our sovereignty, and independence. But is Russia's nuclear arsenal truly so all-encompassing that Putin could feel confident with launching? In terms of pure numbers, the answer is likely yes. The Arms Control Association, or ACA, says that Russia currently has 1,549 strategic nuclear warheads, which are nukes countries keep primed and ready for launch should they need to win a war. The idea behind these nukes is to weaken an enemy to the point they can no longer fight meaning they need to be strong enough to wipe out entire bases and, in some cases, the cities where an opposing country hosts its military leaders. These warheads can be delivered by an array of strategic delivery systems, such as via intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs, and submarines. The ACA believes that Russia has access to 540 delivery systems should it ever choose to launch. The United States is a little behind that number, though not by much. The ACA says that it has 1,419 strategic nuclear warheads, meaning it's 130 behind Russia. However, it also apparently has more deployment options, with 662 strategic delivery systems versus Russia's 540. In truth, it looks like a fairly even battle when it comes to numbers. Each has enough strategic warheads to annihilate the other, so even Putin's claims of having a better stockpile likely wouldn't mean much. However, we can also dig deeper. In addition to its 1,549 strategic warheads, Russia also has a stockpile of between 1,000 and 2,000 non-strategic warheads, otherwise known as tactical nukes, like the ones Putin has already threatened to use in Ukraine. These are intended to help an army win specific battles. For instance, if Russia's forces were vastly overwhelmed, it might use a tactical nuke to take out the enemy on the battlefield, sacrificing its own soldiers in the process as a tactic to whittle the enemy's numbers down. These nuclear weapons are worth discussing because they're not covered by the New START Treaty, which obligates all nuclear-capable nations to maintain specific stockpile numbers and report regularly on them, 
In fact, Russia suspended that treaty in February 2022, the same month it invaded Ukraine, and it has apparently been building its nuclear stockpiles ever since. All told, the ACA says that the American Federation of Scientists believes Russia to have 4,489 nuclear warheads, with a further 1,400 retired warheads that are all in the process of being dismantled. Whether those retired nukes will actually be dismantled is anyone's guess. For its part, the US has about 100 B-61 nuclear gravity bombs deployed in NATO bases in five European countries, including Italy, Turkey, the Netherlands, Germany, and Belgium. That may not count toward its strategic tally. It also has around 1,536 retired warheads awaiting dismantlement, along with a stockpile of around 3,708 warheads across the active and inactive categories. That gives it a total of 5,244, according to the ACA, which is around 650 more than Russia. Add to that the 290 warheads France has, as well as 255 in the UK, and it appears that the West comes out on top in terms of sheer numbers. If Russia isn't ahead in terms of its stockpile, and remember that its suspension of the New START treaty may mean all the numbers the ACA reports aren't accurate, then what about its technology? After all, Putin claims his nuclear triad is far superior to America's, which would give him the confidence to launch. But is that really true? Well, let's start with the land launch capabilities. The US's main option for launching from land is its stock of Minuteman III missiles. America already knows that these are outdated, and it's developing the Sentinel system as a replacement. But for now, the Sentinel is mired in budgetary issues and is behind schedule in its development, leaving the US with its Minuteman III stock. According to the Department of Defense, the U.S. maintains 400 Minuteman III missiles in a continuous state of round-the-clock alert and has done so since 1959. Should Putin launch his nukes, these would be the first of America's nuclear triad to fire. They're capable of carrying W-78 or W-87 nuclear warheads, which have a 335 kiloton and 300 kiloton strength respectively, and can travel for 8,077 miles, more than enough for them to land in Russia. However, concerns exist about the Miniman 3's reliability. In November 2023, several news sources reported that the US was forced to blow up one of its Miniman 3 missiles over the Pacific Ocean after it detected an anomaly in the missile's function. While the US Air Force, which oversaw the launch, didn't elaborate further, the failed test was a major propaganda victory for Putin and perhaps raised his confidence in his own ICBM options. So, what are those options? According to Putin, the main one is the RS-28 Sarmat. Dubbed the Satan II by some, the ICBM is the most powerful missile that Russia has ever produced, and according to Putin, it's assumed combat duty in September 2023. The missile is capable of carrying a 22,000-pound payload, with that payload varying from nuclear warheads to glide vehicles. It's also much rangier than the Minuteman III, with estimates claiming it can fly anywhere between 6,200 miles and 11,200 miles, the latter being over 3,000 miles further than the Minuteman III. On the surface, that makes it seem as though Putin's claims of having a more modern land-based nuclear option is true. However, we don't know how many of the RS-28s Russia has, or how many are prepped for immediate launch. And even its range data could come under question. After all, Russia isn't reporting on its ICBMs under the New START treaty, so the data it provides could be inflated, or at best, estimated. Still, taken at face value, Russia seems to come out on top in the ICBM arena. But what about launch by air? For the US, that launch would come from either one of its 46 B-52H Stratofortress planes or its 20 B-2A Spirit aircraft. The B-52 is America's long-range option, a heavy bomber capable of reaching Russia, assuming it has appropriate protection. The plane can carry both precision-guided conventional weapons and nuclear bombs. It's also seen heavy use, having been involved in 40% of the weapons drops that took place during Operation Desert Storm. The Department of Defense says it'll be in operation until 2040. As for the B-2A, this stealth bomber is in the process of being replaced by the more advanced B-21 Raider, but for now it remains America's chief short-range stealth option. It can travel for 6,000 nautical miles, with any launch against Russia likely to see it stationed in a NATO base in Europe before jetting off over Russian territory to drop its bombs, both combined to create a serious aerial threat. Putin made his choice clear in February 2024 when he was filmed taking a 30-minute flight in one of Russia's 2160M bombers. According to Russia, it's the fastest nuclear-capable strategic bomber in military service, with some reports claiming it can reach a top speed of 1,370 miles per hour. 
that's over twice that achieved by the B-52H and the B-2A, both of which reach speeds around 650 miles per hour. That speed advantage would make it incredibly difficult to shoot out of the sky if Russia went down the aerial route for launch. However, it's worth noting that according to Air Force technology, Russia has only built 35 of these planes since its 1987 entry into military service. Those 35 planes have undergone enhancements since then, but the fact remains that America has more aerial forces. Its 66 planes spread across the B-52H and B-2A fleets could give it aerial superiority over Russia. Still, it's a close-run thing. While the 2160M certainly appears to be more advanced, at least in terms of sheer speed, it may not have the numbers required to be as effective as America's aerial options. And now we move on to the third part of the nuclear triad, sea-based launches. Both the US and Russia have the ability to launch nuclear missiles from submarines, with the US relying on its 14 Ohio-class ballistic missile subs, or SSBNs. Each is capable of carrying a maximum of 20 ballistic missiles, with the Trident 2D5 being the main missile of choice. First deployed in 1990, these missiles can travel for 4,570 miles and carry a nuclear MIRV payload, meaning each can hold multiple nuclear warheads capable of detaching from the missile to strike multiple targets. They're also fast. About two minutes after the missile's third motor kicks in, the Trident 2D5 can reach speeds of up to 8,863 miles per hour, making it incredibly difficult to shoot out of the sky. Still, Putin claims Russia's technology is more advanced than that. For Moscow, its Bory-class submarine would likely be the naval launch choice, of which it has eight in its fleet. It can also fall back on its Delta IV submarines, five of which are in the Russian fleet, giving it the choice of 13 nuclear-capable subs. That's one less than the United States, though the difference is somewhat negligible. Honing in on the Bory class, Russia is currently in the process of updating several of these subs to the Bory A variant, with five already in operation. Those subs are armed with 16 RSM-56 Bulava missiles, each of which is capable of carrying 10 MIRVs and can travel up to 5,150 miles. Details on the missile's top speed aren't readily available, though some sources claim it can reach Mach 24, meaning it travels at 17,771 miles per hour at its top speed. So Putin definitely has a case for the naval arm of his nuclear triad being more modern than America's. Not only do his Bory A submarines pack more missiles than America's Ohio-class subs, but those missiles are faster, can travel further, and carry a stronger payload. Score 1 for Russia Ultimately, there's some credence to Putin's claim that he has superior nuclear options to the United States. The Sarmat missile can travel farther and deliver a stronger payload, as can the missiles fired by Russian subs. And though America has the numbers advantage in the air and may also have a large stock of land-based Minuteman III missiles, it seems to fall short on the technological front. That is, if we assume that the limited information coming out of Russia about its weapons is accurate, which given that Putin is known for inflating the effectiveness and the power of his army, it's an important pinch of salt to take with any of the self-reported information in situations like this. Still, accurate or not, what's important here isn't necessarily whether Putin's claims of having a stronger nuclear triad are true. It's far more important, at least in terms of whether Putin would launch nukes, that he believes his nuclear triad is stronger. That belief could give him the confidence to stack his nuclear arms up against the combined forces of the West, while under the impression that ultimately Russia would come out on top, because it has the ability to hit more targets at greater ranges. The ultimate question is, does Putin being ready to launch nukes mean he's actually on the verge of doing so? It's unlikely for several reasons. First, those paying attention to the threats Putin is making will notice that he qualifies almost all of them with claims that he'll launch if he believes Russia's sovereignty is under threat. To him, any delivery of NATO or simply Western troops into Ukraine would create that type of threat. That's why the rest of the Western world was so quick to distance itself from Macron's suggestion that putting NATO boots on the ground in Ukraine was an option. As long as no Western country does that, Putin would have no justification for a launch and would be unlikely to start a conflict that could only end in global catastrophe. It's also worth repeating that this is far from the first time that Russia has threatened to use its nuclear might to get its way. Putin is no stranger to this scare tactic himself, having already claimed that he might use tactical nuclear weapons to secure victory in Ukraine long before these most recent threats. Back in the 1960s, Nikita Khrushchev, with a shoe in hand, banged on the desk of the UN's headquarters in New York, promising further interventions 
for what he saw as toady American imperialism. In other words, stop interfering in Russia's affairs or we'll launch a nuke. That same man caused the Caribbean nuclear crisis two years after that outburst, though nothing came of that situation, and throughout the 70s and 80s, various Russian leaders were quick to make the nuclear threat when things weren't going their way, with only the rise of Mikhail Gorbachev steering Russia in the opposite direction. Putin's quick to claim that his nuclear threats are not a bluff, but they're also threats that many have heard from Russia time and time again over the last 60 years. That's not a reason to be complacent. Russia has the capability to launch nuclear weapons, and assuming Western soldiers enter Ukraine, Putin would have a reason to do so. However, the threat isn't imminent as long as NATO keeps its distance. Of course, it's worth pointing out that Putin ramped up his nuclear rhetoric in the build-up to Russia's presidential election. All of his most recent comments came just days before the Russians went to the polls, between March 15th and March 17th. In truth, Putin's victory in those elections was never in doubt. But by making his nuclear threats, he projected the image of a leader who's fighting for Russian sovereignty, as well as sending the message that it's better to stay with him during a time of war than it would be to elect anybody who might cozy up to the West. Ultimately, Putin is ready and able to launch nuclear weapons, and he may even have a point when it comes to his nuclear triad being more modern than America's. But none of this means he's actually willing to launch, at least not until he feels that Russia and perhaps more importantly, his own reign as the country's leader is under threat. Now check out China drops list of demands on the US to prevent nuclear war, or watch this instead.